Um, and so I'll share with you my perspective today, what I've learned uh, and, and in uh, the six or seven companies I've been running marketing at. Uh, all of them, the only marketer there. Uh, I think in one case I had a couple of people I hired after a couple of years, but usually it's just me. So I'm the director of marketing, the marketing manager, the marketing specialist, the administrator, and everything else. Um, and I think what's, what's key with that, and, and you know, I almost titled my presentation. We're not going to get there. Let's see, we got tech support here? There we go, perfect. So I almost titled my presentation straight out of low cash. If you guys have ever seen that, uh, the movie CB4, you'll, you'll recognize that. Because everywhere I've worked, I've had a ridiculously low budget, um, no staff, no resources, limited access. And what happens in the process is you've got to be creative. You've got to duct tape your strategies. And you've got to try to use technology in whatever creative way you can to affect the same type of results that people with budgets 10, 20, 30 times your size and staff that are much bigger than yours are able to do easily. Now, when we start to think this way as solo or small marketers and with small budgets, the first lesson or perspective I'd like to share with you is that I want you to remember that you're in, sure, I want you to remember that you're in a box. You have limits. You can't get rid of those limits. Your budget's not going bigger. The amount of time you get with your staff and your colleagues to get information is minimal. Once you recognize you're in a box, I think then you'll be able to change the perspective of that box and then enhance the size of it and the capabilities that you can do within it. So I'll give you a few uh, sort of guidances today. And, and the first one I'll suggest is to start with the least common denominator. So what I mean by this is as you think about your goals, and your, your primary goal is selling your product or service, start to step back and think about what's a necessary and sufficient goal that will always lead to the closed deal. Uh, in you know, my previous job, we uh, sold preclinical research services to pharma, and we knew that we would never close a deal unless we got that prospect on site to look at our resources. So instead of trying to close the deal and aim for that goal, I always aimed for uh, that step back to get them to come to site. So by moving your goal line back, you start to find a way to achieve a different sub-goal that is a necessary and sufficient uh, component of that primary goal. Now, the most ubiquitous goal or least common denominator for us is going to be that uh, ubiquitous request a demo uh, goal. In my current job, it's it. And it doesn't matter if it's not a great or interesting goal. It's a necessary and sufficient goal. You're going to require this. Every single prospect that ever uh, becomes a client is going to have to request a demo first. And because of that, that's my target. My target isn't closing a deal. My target is requesting a demo. Now, I thought I'd use this bracket just because we're in the middle of the final four. And uh, I'm not sure how that logo got there in the middle. I don't think it has anything to do with me going to UNC, but regardless, let's just pretend that random logo is that goal, the request a demo goal. What I want you to do next is think about all the sub goals that lead to that goal. These are no longer necessary and sufficient goals. Uh, these could be things like downloading a white paper, um, reading an ebook, hitting three key pages, track and, and record what those sub goals are. That's your strategy. Now you're gonna start hitting all these sub goals as you aim towards your primary LCD or least common denominator. And by doing that, you can build out a simple and effective strategy that you can, uh, you can execute on. And you can execute on pretty simply as you fill out each of these sub goals and develop your content and your distribution accordingly. Now, I'm gonna skip some of the uh, parts of uh, developing content right now. We'll talk about that later and, and distribution as well. Uh, what I want to focus in on next, though, is what you do when your leads come in. So as a small marketer, you, how much time do you have to deal with leads? Maybe an hour a week. You've got PR to deal with. You've got freelancers. You've got your leadership you have to meet with. You've got to find a way to streamline those leads that are actually coming in and find a way to manage the process of it. Um, I'm going to show you two different tech stacks I've used. And I'm doing that because I want to 
uh, present that I'm agnostic about which technology you use. I don't think it matters which technology you use. I think it matters what your lead process is and how you want to manage your leads. Then you, you hack the uh, tech stack to manage that. So in, in this case, this was my previous job and this was our, our flow. Uh, we started, I had, a, I had a market researcher. I had a little money and I invested in a researcher who would check LinkedIn and um, qualify every lead that came in. Who are they? What are their characteristics? What company do they come from? What are their interests? What are their drugs that they're developing? Because we were working with that as well. And that information would then uh, be put into actually Pardot, but we would use MailChimp to start uh, emailing them and communicating with them when they opted in uh, to a level. We put them into Pardot and start our automation programs. When they were nurtured enough, we'd shoot them over to Salesforce where our sales team would then take it over and aim for the goal, which was of course a big pot of money at the end. So that's my former one, this is my current one. And again, you know, they were both built with, based on the limitations that I had and my goals. And so in this case, I don't have any um, resources for a market researcher, so I had to find a way to do it myself easily. And so I used these three tools, Hunter, uh, which is an email verifier. You can you know, toss in an email name and it'll come back and tell you if it's a, an actual email or not. Um, which is helpful when you're prospecting uh, and trying to find leads to toss into your system. Uh, I should warn you that most of the Fortune 500s have now figured this out, so they'll accept any email and tell you it's valid, which means uh, the whole process is moot, but you can still do it with, you know, maybe half of the companies out there haven't touched that yet. Winmo is a database I use. Uh, I target marketers in the pharmaceutical industry right now, and Winmo's got a ton of contacts in the marketing industry as well as a lot of market research. So I didn't have the resources to hire someone in to do it. I find the tools that can mimic that as good as I can. It's not as good as a market researcher, but it keeps me going. And I'm trying to make sure that I've got my engine moving as much as possible. Now in the middle at the heart is a automation program, in this case SharpSpring. Uh, again, I'm not advocating them unless somebody from SharpSpring wants to fund my next trip to the Bahamas and then I'll advocate for them. Um, but I, what, you put your automation program in the center, make sure every single thing around that is integrated. So I run my display ads with AdButler, I have my landing pages with Unbounce, all of those integrated with SharpSpring, and uh, push my leads over to Salesforce when that time comes. And, and here's something key, when I push my leads over to Salesforce, everything that that lead ever did has to transfer over. So make sure your integrations are in play, find your automation program that matches with your sales platform, Make sure that data are always falling over, because if you don't, you're gonna be sending emails every single time you push a lead over to Salesforce saying, hey Greg, this guy went and visited our white paper, downloaded and then went to these three pages. As you try to give that intelligence to your salesperson, automate it, it gets built into Salesforce and their open activities. You don't have to send that email. And Salesforce will just send the email to them and they'll know what to do. What you're trying to do is m minimize the amount of time and effort you have to put in to get the same effect at the end. Now, this is an example of uh, what I do when the leads come in, and this is your basic persona or bucket set. So I've defined about 14 different categories of individual, with general being the catch-all here. Uh, in my case, uh, again, I deal with pharma, and so you know, I have buckets like pharma director or agency leadership or brand manager. Now, what I've tried to do is get narrow enough so that I can find ways to customize my messages to them in the future, even though right now I only have three or four different uh, pathways that people go through. Um, but what I'm doing is planning for next year or the year after, so I don't have to do this work again. Um, now when you bucket them, what you wanna do is have a plan in place, an automated plan in place, so that once you tag an individual to a particular persona, automation takes over. You've done your manual job, you put your eyes on that person, you've understood who they are and what they might be interested in with your product, you've done your research, now let automation take over. Assign, so when I, for example, assign any of my prospects to one of these six categories, they immediately go into a nurture program. That's essential, you wanna make sure, and I know this is a little bit of a basic concept, but you wanna make sure that process is automated. You don't have time to go back and do it again. Uh, I, I usually go into uh, my automation program twice a week, that's all the time I have to really manage this, and each time I go in I spend about 45 minutes looking at all the new leads that came in and assigning them to the right one. Um, I found that works for me, you may wanna do it more if you have more leads, I don't have that active of a, 
of a lead program where I'm getting tons of them. Two days works for me. Whatever works for you is perfect, but find a way to automate that process. And make sure that you have uh, processes for every type of individual. And, and these are three examples of non-automated processes. So, for example, if someone is categorized as a white gloves uh, lead, uh, that's defined as someone who's a CEO or VP at Big Pharma, the first thing I do is I, I send a message to my CEO, and he goes and personally contacts them. That should be a sort of white glove experience. They never get any automation. I don't do any of that with them. It's always a personal contact. Uh, ditto with investors. You know, these are people we want to give us money. We want to have that extra touch. We don't automate any engagement with them. Payor or partners, uh, we use the term payor because our partners are insurance companies, uh, go right to my VP of business development because, again, that's a big play that we want to make sure we have personal contact with. And anybody tagged as a competitor goes in the trash. Um, actually, I put them in a purgatory category where they'll never receive any email from us. Now, you know, not that I have any issue with sharing with them, but I don't want to extend the energy to that. Um, every once in a while, I'll send an email to competitors when they come in with their Gmail address just to have a little fun with them. Nobody ever responds back, though. So, um, And then finally, I have a bucket, which I, I strongly urge you to think about, and I call it influencers. An influencer is someone who may not be a uh, buyer persona, but there's something interesting about them. And I want to try to have a personal conversation with them. So as an example, I had a guy come in a couple of months ago who uh, was one of the earliest app developers in digital health. Not a buyer. He's developing his own company. He might even be a competitor. But I found him interesting, and I wanted to make sure that I was going to contact him. So I dump him in the influencer bucket. And every once in a while, maybe every couple of weeks, I'll go through there, see who I put in there, and send out messages to them and try to have personal contact. So find those conduits to manage your automated programs, but also find those conduits where you can put into play personal connections and contacts with those prospects as well. Now, once you've done all this and built your lead management system, you need to think about how you can attribute your leads. Where are they coming from? And you're doing this so you can make assumptions about where your next spend is going to be. So this is just an example of a few of my uh, sort of channels or entry points that leads come in. And what you want to make sure is that as the lead comes in, the data always pass from their entry point into SharpSpring, your automation program, and then continue to follow over to your sales program. That's getting rid of your personal time. You don't want to be involved in that. And if you do that around the tail end when you run a report in, say, Salesforce, you have a list of where that source came, and that can define your next spend. Um, this is an example of a hack I do. And this is in a, a product called Unbounce, and these are two landing pages. So what I wanted to do was be able to differentiate uh, which ones came from Google AdWords and which ones came from LinkedIn. This is not a way that anyone would, I think, call the best way. But, uh, and, and the reason I want to I wanna tell you this is because I want to explain to you what we have to deal with when we're dealing with limited resources. To solve the problem of attributing better at that time, I needed a developer to develop two forms that could get integrated with Unbounce and SharpSpring, and it was going to take eight hours of time that I didn't have because I was launching a program that day. So what I'll suggest to you is hack away. It's just you. Do things that work for you. In that case, I created two different URLs, one for LinkedIn and one for Google AdWords, pushed out those URLs to my LinkedIn uh, advertising program and my AdWords advertising program. So when the user came in, I knew exactly where they came in from just by virtue of the page they came in. Now, the better way to do that is to create a form that integrates. But when we're, when we're thinking about surviving and making things work, we've got to find the quickest and easily hackable way to do it. If it's messy, I suggest you do it anyways. Uh, you can fix it later, but how can you keep things going right away? Well, you can do it by making assumptions and making decisions right away. And most importantly, you're not going to get automation to answer all of your questions. You're going to have to dig in. You're going to have to do the dirty work to find out where those lead sources are coming from. It could be from a, a phone call sent over to you from you know, administrative support. It could be from an email. It could be from all these different resources. At some point, you're going to sit down, and you're going to have to do the dirty work. And I'll walk you through just an example of some of the dirty work I can't get around I have to do each time with a lead. And This is just a view what, that my automation program gives me of how the lead came in, what pages they went to. And actually, I left out the part at the bottom where they tell you the URL that they originated from. And so when you remember those Google and LinkedIn uh, URLs, I can tell right there what their uh, source is and then go in and tag that source accordingly. I can also tell out which forms they filled out first and 
That helps me understand which of my uh, white papers or eBooks was that primary influencer. There's software that can do this for you, but if you don't have the budget for it, you're gonna have to find a manual way to do this. And for me, that means looking at each lead. Uh, a lot of times I'll only look at it if that lead converts to an opportunity, because that's my target, of course, as someone who has a actual product or service on the play that we're trying to sell them. And then I'll be able to tell which opportunity uh, actually um, converted, which uh, source converted that opportunity. And, and the reason I do that and care about this data is because I'm trying to make decisions regarding my budget and my time. Do I want to put more time into Google? Do I want to put it into display ads? Where do I want to put my money? Um, this is a assumption dashboard I created, a very simple uh, spreadsheet. And what I've done is try to come up with all the channels I was planning on working with and make some assumptions. What might I spend? Uh, how much traffic will you get from that? What's the industry standard for click-through rate? So, you know, when I created this, I had no data, no understanding of what my prospects would do, what kind of engagement happens in this space I'd entered into. And so I used industry standards to, to find what those click-through rates and conversion rates were. And as I move through uh, the process and start to gain new data, I change my dashboard and I change my assumptions. And those changes are what drive my next decision. I'll give you an example. Um, so the top one is display ads, and you know, I guessed, okay, based on industry standards, you can, you know, your cost per conversion is going to be about 130 bucks based on this model. Well, I put it into play to see if it worked out. My cost per conversion turned into 900 bucks. Uh, it was a terrible one. Uh, you know, in my last industry, my cost per conversion for that was maybe 50 or 60. So each industry is going to be different, each audience is going to be different, each assumption is going to be different. You want to use some simple method to learn as you move through time. And the lesson I learned is don't use display ads. I don't do them anymore. I don't put my energy into that. What I found, though, was that LinkedIn ads converted at actually about half that cost, about 20, 25 bucks. That's where most of my spend goes. So this assumption dashboard should be there with you along the way, and it should be what you use to uh, make your decisions. Where are you gonna spend your time? Where are you gonna spend your money? Um, again, when we're working with low budgets, we can't use the, the sort of technologies that answer these questions for you. We've gotta find ways to do it ourselves. It takes a little bit more time, but it answers your, your question.